Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Well, good morning and happy Sunday to you and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here and it's my delight to be able to share with you this morning. Um, let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you for the gift of this day and the gift of your love and the fact that we still celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are Easter people. Uh, because of what you have done in our lives and who you are. Uh, today we give to you, God, and specifically for this time, I pray for more of you and for less of me. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Have, have you ever known someone who experienced a radical transformation? I, now, I'm not talking about somebody who changed the color of their hair or maybe even lost a whole lot of weight, or any other physical transformation. But have you ever known someone that had a radical transformation on the inside, and then it changed everything about that person? The, the way they acted, uh, the way that they thought, um, everything about them. Well, have you ever heard of the name Spud Webb before. Now, if you're a basketball fan, there's a good chance you've heard that name before. Uh, Spud Webb was uh, a professional basketball player in the 1980s. Uh, however, he wasn't your ordinary basketball player. In a world and in a profession filled with athletes that were usually six foot eight to six foot nine, Spud Webb stood at a whopping five foot six inches. Uh, take a look at this picture of him. Uh, it's, it's one of those times where uh, one of these things is not like the other. Uh, Webb, he was, a, he was a star high school basketball player, but he did, he did not get picked up by any major university to play basketball for them. So instead, he, he chose to play for a two-year college. And he actually led that two-year college to a junior national championship. But as you can imagine, he had a hard time breaking into the NBA. And it wasn't until our own Atlanta Hawks picked him up that he began playing professional basketball. He played for four seasons with the Hawks. And for four years, he helped the Hawks make it to the playoffs. Well, in the NBA, each year there's a slam dunk competition. And in 1986, Spud Webb was the shortest player in this competition. He competed against people that were at least a foot taller than him. And at the end of this competition, Spud Webb was crowned the winner of the slam dunk competition. Well, shortly after this experience, uh, Spud was, uh, was giving this testimony. So these are his words. He said, 
I used to pray that the Lord would make me bigger when I was in junior high school and senior high, but every time I went to measure myself or to stand in front of the mirror, I'd always be the same size. And then one day I got the message. So I said to the Lord, if you, want, if you won't make me bigger on the outside, will you make me bigger on the inside? And the Lord liked that prayer, and that's what He's helped me become. You see, Spud Webb was changed from the inside out, and it changed everything for him. Well, today we're going to look at someone else in the Bible, someone who experienced what I would consider a radical transformation, a transformation that impacted the spread of Christianity greater than perhaps anyone else in the history of the church besides Jesus Christ Himself. So, our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the New Testament book of Acts. It's Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. And hear these words, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And we give thanks for the reading of God's most holy word. I mean, talk about drama. This has to be one of the most dramatic stories in all of Scripture, and, and perhaps the history of Christianity as far as conversions are concerned. Well, how much do you know about Paul in the Bible? You know, we talk a lot about Paul, but how much do we really know about him? Well, this morning, I'm going to give you a very brief history lesson, and I, I'll try my hardest not to bore you with this, just so that we can know a little bit more about who Paul was. Well, first of all, before Paul was Paul, he was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Saul was a very well-educated young man, and he was seeking to become a rabbi. He was a devout Jewish man who is vehemently opposed to the spread of Christianity. So much opposed that he utilized violence uh, against the followers of Jesus in an effort to stop the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We even read that Saul was present when Stephen, a, a devout follower of Jesus, was stoned to death. You see, Stephen was the first Christian martyr. We read this in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 57. It says, At this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at Stephen, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul approved of their killing him. Well, Saul was born in Tarsus. Uh, Tarsus was an affluent and diverse community that greatly valued education. And Saul moved to Jerusalem to study religion with one of the most influ influential rabbis of the time. His name was Gamaliel, because Paul saw, or Saul was seeking to become a rabbi himself. Saul tells us a little bit more about himself later in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 22, verse 3. I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicilia, but brought up in this city. 
I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained by the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. Well, I mean, now that we know just a little bit about Saul, we have to ask the question, why in the world did he persecute Christians so intensely? I mean, the short of it, and I guess the short answer to that question is that Saul did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Therefore, Saul's goal was to persecute Jesus' followers in order to stop the spread of Christianity. Acts chapter 8 verse 3 says, But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. If, if you and I had asked Saul why he did what he did, he might say that he was doing a service to God by attempting to stop the spread of false teaching. You see, Saul, like many other rabbis, they believed that, that the law of God had to be obeyed before the Messiah would come. Uh, the author and theologian Warren Wiersbe, he states the following about Saul to give us a little more of a glimpse into Saul's life and personality and reasoning for doing what he did. Wiersbe says this, Had you stopped him, Saul, and asked for his reasons, he might have said something like this, Jesus of Nazareth is dead. Do you expect me to believe that a crucified nobody is the promised Messiah? According to our law, anybody who is hung on a tree is cursed. Would God take a cursed false prophet and make him a Messiah? No. His followers are preaching that Jesus is both alive and doing miracles through them. But their power comes from Satan, not from God. This is a dangerous sect, and I intend to eliminate it before it destroys our historic Jewish faith. You see, Saul was convinced that Jesus was not the Messiah and that the followers of Jesus were spreading false information as they gained momentum in the church. So, in our Scripture today, Paul was on his way to Damascus. He, he was on his way there to persecute Christians. You see, Christianity was growing in Damascus, but on his way, Saul had an encounter with God that changed everything. You see, Saul rejected Jesus as the Messiah, but Jesus did not reject Saul. Uh, God blinded Saul because he needed to show Saul that he was wrong. Uh, God had to get his attention somehow, and and when you call someone to go blind, that is a surefire way to get someone's attention. But, but before God caused Saul to become physically blind, he was spiritually blind. So, so what exactly happened to, to Saul, who later became Paul? Well, in this encounter with God, Saul discovered that Jesus was not dead after all. Jesus is alive, and He truly is the Messiah. And that changed everything for Paul. Paul eventually wrote a majority of the New Testament, and he founded churches, and, and he led others to spreading the gospel of Christ. Warren Wiersbe again, he says this, he says, the Hebrew of the Hebrews would become the apostle to the Gentiles. The persecutor would become a preacher, and the legalistic Pharisee would become the great proclaimer of the grace of God. <laughs> I'd say that was quite a dramatic turnaround for Saul, who became Paul. 
Well, this is, this is great. This is a great story in Scripture, and it's something that, that we're reminded of time and time again um, throughout the teachings of Scripture. But, but what does this mean for us today? What, what does this story have anything to do with us today in the year 2022? Well, I, I want to highlight three takeaways that I think this passage says to us today. First of all, while yes, this is a, a recount of a story of conversion, it's also a story of surrender. Paul experienced both conversion and surrender in this story. He had an encounter with a living God in Jesus Christ. And when one encounters the living God, one can't help but surrender. So it begs the question, have you completely surrendered to God? Or or are you still clinging to your old ways and to your old habits? When we surrender to God, God can do amazing things in us and through us, just like Paul. The second takeaway I think this, this passage has for us today is that there's, there's a truth here for all of us and for every single person in the world today. And here's that truth. Even if you reject Jesus, Jesus will not reject you. There's room for everyone at the table of the Lord. I, th- there may be someone watching this today that you, maybe you have rejected Jesus, or, or maybe someone in your family or a close friend has rejected Jesus. Well, well the good news is that Jesus has, re- has not rejected you or, or anyone else that you know. Uh, you or someone else may not have had an experience that causes you to go blind like, like Paul, but, but perhaps God is wanting to create some kind of radical transformation in your own life. And if you have experienced a radical transformation, God is wanting you to share that with someone else as a follower of Jesus Christ. They need to see for themselves that Jesus is, is alive, and that Jesus is the Messiah. And the third takeaway for us, I think, in this story is that this is a story of trust and obedience. In the sixth verse of our Scripture today, Jesus tells Paul, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. You know, Paul didn't have any any of the details as far as what was going to happen next, but he trusted Jesus, and he obeyed this command. And as they say, the rest is history, because Paul continued to follow Jesus and continued to obey Jesus for the rest of his life. Now, there's a potential danger in all of this, and that danger is that we, we spend too much of our time focusing our time and our energy on Paul. While this is an incredible account and and a witness of the faithfulness of one incredible person, Paul would be the first one to say that he was a servant of Jesus Christ. He's not the one to be praised and worshiped in all of this. It's, It's the one who caused the change in him and led him to do incredible things for the kingdom of God. You know, when we follow God and when God allows us to do incredible things for the kingdom, we have to be careful not to receive the attention ourselves, but to point to the one who causes the change, the redemption, and the transformation in our lives. You know, I'm a I'm a fan of Broadway musicals, and, and one of the, the newer ones, although it's been out for a little while now, it's, it's titled Wicked. 
And I don't know if you know this musical or even if you know this story or not, but in short, the, the story of Wicked is, is based uh, on the developing friendship between two people. Um, the first, her name is Elphaba, also known as the Wicked Witch of the West. And the second character in this budding friendship is Glinda, also known as the Good Witch. This is the story that happens before what we know as the Wizard of Oz. And it's, a, it's an unlikely friendship, an unlikely relationship that grows throughout the show. And, and towards the end of the show, there's a, there's a song that they sing, a, a duet. And there's a particular line in this song that strikes me. Uh, and, and this is what it says. Who can say if I've been changed for the better. But because I knew you, I've been changed for good. <laughs> I, I tend to think that, that Paul would perhaps say the same thing. Because he knew Jesus, he had an encounter with a living God. Because he knew Jesus, he was changed for good. So what about you? What about me? Even if we haven't had this dramatic of an encounter and experience with God like Paul did, can we say with assurance that, that because we know Jesus, that we've been changed for good. And if we've been changed for good, how are we going to change the world around us for good? God, we thank you for, for the life of faithful witnesses and servants that, that point to you God, that when we read of, of radical transformation, we know that it can happen within us too. We're thankful for the life and the ministry of Paul and for the foundation that he laid for, for the spread of your church. And God, today we know that you, you are calling us to continue in this, this faithful account, to continue to spread your word and your message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray, God, that we might be uh, beacons of light and hope, that others would see you in us, and that we would point others to you, and that the world around us truly might be changed for good. We love you, and we praise you, and we pray all this in the name of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image. And what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our. 
When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.